Alrighty, guys. Um, we're a bit strapped for time, so I'm going to start right away. Um, blimey, that's it. This is like the last session of Devo. That was amazing. Who had a good time? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Jeez, one more session and it's off, off for a whole year until the next one. You know, you love it. Um, okay. All right. Well, welcome to my talk. My name's Tim Oliver. I am the third in a line of Tims to present at DevWorld. Um, a long line, a long lineage of Tims. Um, this is my fifth DevWorld and my fourth as a presenter, and I'm very happy to be back. Hey, Louis. Um, he's tweeting at me. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I'm very happy to be back. I'm really excited to talk to you about a thing called Realm, which is a little, little cool little thing I found on the internet last year, and I think everyone should know about it because it's really freaking sweet. Alrighty. So, uh, obligatory anvil effects. Let's talk data. Not that data. All right. Um, just really quickly, I, I, I don't think this is necessary, but I, th I thought I'd be remiss if I didn't actually mention it. Uh, I am an employee of Realm, um, so that means even though I, I say I'm not biased, I'm inherently biased. Um, I'd like to say I'm, say I'm in, a, in a rather special position because what actually happened was I didn't start with Realm at the beginning, but um, anyone who's been to my talks at DevOps before knows I'm, I'm working on this little comic book reader for kicks and giggles, um, and I actually found out about Realm last year, put it into my app, um, and was amazed at how good it was. And you know, it says a registered logo because I just got the trademark for it. Uh, yeah, legal stuff. Um, and I was I was so impressed at Realm back then that I did a talk about it. Yeah, and at a Perth iOS meetup, and Realm saw it and offered me a job to do that uh, on a more ongoing basis, which is really really cool. So I'd like to say that yes, I, I am an employee, but at the same time, I'm also an active user, uh, and, I, and I love looking at the product from a user perspective. And so that's the angle I'm going to come to you today with. All right, so. Before we can actually talk about solutions, let's actually establish what the problem is. Um, what exactly is the problem here? So let's imagine you're making an app. Might be a bit of a stretch, um, hopefully not. Um, and basically the app generates some kind of like unique data, like data that cannot be regenerated. Maybe it's user input, maybe it's some kind of cache information from a web service, maybe it's just some kind of like transient data that was generated by the app just running. Um, just for a little visual representation, uh, for example, I made a, like a little quick app that uh, lets you save punny dog names, because we, we love dogs at Realm. Um, and the, ba the basic scenario is the user creates these names, puts them into the app. The app is then evicted from memory completely. People tweeting at me again. Um, evicted from memory, and you, you know completely shut down. You open up the app again, and the data's still there. I know, right? Rocket science. What a niche. How many apps need that kind of functionality? Geez, like tens of dozens of users, you know, all that. Um, but all jokes aside, um, for what is an inherently low-level, kind of like fundamental requirement of a lot of software architecture, persisting data to disk, it's it, 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 relatively easy, but I think it could be a lot easier. This is the thing. Um, the thing is, to actually create a solution that's, that's really good, like the thing that we'd really want, it would have to be smart, like it would have to be able to, you know, be real, like memory is limited on mobile devices, so it has to be able to, to know like what is actually required, not just bring everything, bring everything into memory and put it all out. Like it has to be smart enough to actually um, go through and actually know what, what it actually is required. Um, and that, that leads on to speed. So obviously you've got inherent things like disk I/O and decoding and re-encoding when saving. Um, that can all add up. And any any instance where you might actually cause a lockup would obviously mean like uh, a bad user experience if the UI starts locking up. Um, and, and most critically of all, for these kinds of systems, what you'd really want is it to be safe. Like if there's any chance of the data getting corrupted on the way to the disk, or even if we're reading it back to the disk, or if like two threads tried to write it right to the disk at the same time and both didn't succeed, um, that's obviously catastrophic because, um, thank you, Louis. Um, it's very obviously catastrophic because uh, your systems failed, the users lost their data, and that probably means you know, uninstall, one star review, and you know, mass pandemonium. Um, so, Without even going into third-party solutions, what have we got on, let's just say, iOS? So it's probably a lot more on Mac, but what have we got on iOS? Um, okay, so this, there's three. You can, I, I can think of three off the top of my head. You've got basic serialization, like you're taking an object, an NS object, and subjecting it to either NS coding or NS JSON serialization, and you get a representation that you can just save the disk, like just dump it to disk. Um, that's probably the most basic one. Obviously, the next one you have is SQLite, um, which has became with the very first version of iPhone OS um, and was probably held as the standard for a long time. And then a little bit later on came Core Data, which is basically Apple's abstraction on top of uh, SQLite that basically abstracts away the SQLite components and turns it into like a, a, an, an object relational mapping system. What are you grinning at? 
Okay, good. Cool. So I'll just go through each one really, really quickly for time constraints. Um, I don't really mind J like doing JSON serialization. Um, like, it's, like if I'm doing an open source library and I, I just need some way to persist data really quickly, I don't want to bring in a giant dependency, I think it's okay. So in small cases, it's, it's pretty good. Like, yeah, it minimizes dependencies. That being said, it's not smart, obviously. Um, it's either all or nothing, all in memory, all in the disk. You've got no in-betweens. Um, which can inherently mean uh, speed issues, especially now that you're, if you've got a lot of data, you're actually having to do a lot of conversion, like deserializing, reserializing. Um, so that can add it all up. And it's definitely not thread safe. I mean, you have to do, do it one step at a time, make sure everything's saved in sequence, otherwise you absolutely, absolutely get collisions and you'll lose, you'll lose your data. Um, SQLite is good. I've written a Pokemon app with SQLite, which was good. Um, and there was a lot of data involved in that. Um, but obviously, SQLite itself is a very, very uh, technical sort of thing. Like obviously, the API itself is in C. Um, you have to know what structured query, query languages are. And then on top of that, you actually have to know, like, understand the concept of primary keys and foreign keys, and actually set up the schema properly. Otherwise, you'll suffer um, speed, like, like just, like sort of speed lag, like lag and stuff like that when you actually do a query. Um, that being said, after, after you've done that, um, you don't actually get objects out of SQLite. So now you actually have the additional overhead of, of implementing code to take a set of uh, results from a query and map it to a model. So you can actually insert it into a data source or something like that. So then you actually have additional code requirements. Um, on top of that, if you ever decide you need to change a schema, like add a new column, remove a new column, obviously that, that has to be managed manually as well, which means more code. Um, but on the plus side, like queries are very fast. Like there's, there's very few things that can beat SQLite. So, um, if you know what you're doing, it's definitely the best thing for speed. Um, and obviously, to, to, come to, to counteract that, that issue of the amount of code you need to write for SQLite, there are a lot of third-party libraries out there that um, do a really good job of actually um, abstracting away the, um, the, the um, object mapping component of it. Um, Cordata. Who here likes Cordata? One, two, three, four. Cool. Awesome. That's about as much as I thought. <laughs> Has anyone here not tried Cordata? Okay, one. Okay, so, so the other guy is like, okay. I see where you're going. Okay. Um, my, my little comic book app used Core Data for two years. Like, I, I used that as, as an excuse to learn Core Data originally. Um, but I, I just couldn't cope with the massive learning curve. Like, like just the whole concept of having to have a, a persistent file coordinator attached to an NMS managed object model, which generated a context, which then actually lets you pull, pull in objects from memory, and then having to, to like manage multiple managed object con contexts across threads. Like, to actually get to the point where you're, you're competent enough to actually write code can take a lot of effort. And on top of that, it takes a lot of boilerplate code. Like all that, all that, all I just said there, like that's a good 50 lines of code to even get set up before you can even start using Core Data. Um, and another thing I don't really like, like about Core Data is its operation is very opaque. Like if something breaks, um, what, what, what you'll actually get back can be very, very, you know, ambiguous. Like sometimes you won't, you'll get a cryptic message or you'll get like no message, which is not, not a good sign. Um, or it'll just crash, and you'll have no idea what happened. Um, and that's, that's like I just mentioned there. You can easily have issues where you did something that wasn't technically correct, but Core Data didn't say anything, and it, it did its best to, to keep coping, but then it just ended up crashing down the line. I had, I had this issue a lot when I was trying to pass objects between threads. Uh, again, which is something you probably shouldn't do. You're supposed to actually manage uh, uh, separate objects per thread. But again, I didn't actually learn that until I found out why my code was crashing. Um, and yeah, so. Just to follow on with that, um, passing data between threads can be tricky. Um, I had a lot of instances in my own app where the, the model would, would come out of the store, but then it would either have half the data or none of the data, or like just, just a string saying data not found. So I was like, oh, what? Um, and it just took a lot, of, a lot of just going back and trying to debug, um, which obviously just means more time and more code. Um, and as user defaults, no. <laughs> No, um, like I'm just saying, like for for a proper like system where you're persisting data to disk, um, and it's user defaults is good for settings and tiny little things. But um, I've seen people try and write like to do apps where every single entry was like in in its user defaults, and that's that's no, no don't do that. It's bad. Um, so what what else is there? Well, um, last year a company in San Francisco threw their hat into the ring. Um, it's called Realm. Has anyone actually heard of Realm before this? Couple, excellent. Has anyone actually tried it before this? Cool, excellent, couple, awesome, all right. Um, so for the rest of you who haven't heard of it before, um, Realm is, let's see, it is an open source-ish, I'll cover that later, um, database framework. So 
designed to be a replacement, a complete replacement for core data or SQL 8. Um, it is implemented entirely from scratch. This is, this is not like a, a, a wrapper around core data or a wrapper around SQL 8. This is a completely from the ground up implemented um, database system that is based on the ORM model, but it's not technically correct to say the ORM model because it doesn't actually, it's a bit crazy how it works. In fact, it doesn't copy information from disk, rather it uses memory mapping to actually link your property straight to um, the data on disk, which means very, like zero copy, very fast, and very easy to work with. Yep, so it's a very small API. Like it was intentionally designed, designed to be very, very small. Um, it's bloody fast, and it's thread safe. Um, and another good thing about it is it's actually cross-platform. So it works on Mac, it works on iOS, even works on Android. You can pass a file generated from one platform to another and it'll just work. Um, and the good news is, is um, the, the, the chaps in San Francisco and, and there's another office in Copenhagen are currently working on more, including .NET for Windows. Uh, finally, this, this needs to be said, it's completely free. Like there's no, there's no, there's no money involved here, there's no, there's no fees. Um, Realm, Realm gets its, its uh, revenue from, at the moment, uh, VC funding and some enterprise level um, services. But for, for normal app developers, it's completely free. Which, um, so there's no, there's, no, there's no strings attached here. Is that going to stay that way? Yes. Yep. Is that your word? Yes, that's my word. I, like, we, we had like several meetings this year. It was, um, the, the, there, are, there are obviously, we're discussing monetization models at the moment. And one of them, one of them was to bring in additional optional Paid features on top of that, but everything I'll be describing today is free and will remain free. Yep. How fast? Really fast. So if you look, if you compare it to SQLite, it's pretty freaking fast, which is really good. Um, SQLite is obviously a bit older. Like SQLite was started in I think 2000 or earlier, um, and obviously wasn't designed for smartphones. Whereas this one was actually designed from the ground up for smartphones. So it's able to leverage like uh, mobile architecture a lot better. Um, and it's, it's, it's fundamental design also means you get better performance. Um, this, that was for, for counts. Uh, for queries, um, it, if, you, if you know how to leverage SQLite properly, like we discovered down the line after we made this chart, if, I think it was like if you know how to structure a cached query of SQLite so you, um, properly, you can, make, uh, you can actually get SQLite to perform faster in terms of queries, but again, you have to know exactly what you're doing with SQLite and obviously there's more code involved. So. Um, I'll just, just put a caveat there. It's, it's faster than everything else, including core data, but sometimes SQLite can still be faster. Um, and inserts is really fast as well. Cool. Um, so what, is, what, is the, what does the actual uh, structure look like? So at the very, at the very center, we have this, this chewy, crunchy center called the core. The core is a completely self-contained C++ library that, that all the logic is contained in. So everything like the file format definition and all, all the logic in, in terms of saving is, is abstract, is defined in a core. And then what happens is for every single language you support, such as Objective-C, Swift, Java, and, and upcoming ones, we, are, we actually have uh, specifically created bindings that, that just map the, basically abstract the logic from the core into a native API for each platform. So there's a specially tailored API for Objective-C. Um, as of earlier this year, completely native Swift one, before we were just using an Objective-C binding, um, as well as one for Android. And, that, and it's, yeah, and basically, um, what I was mentioning before, the, the bindings are open source, but the core is still not open source. We're, we're, we have plans to open source it, uh, Relatively soon, but but there's a lot of stuff in there we need to clean up before we're, we're willing to open source it. Okay, so who's using it? So I've said all this. Um, if you're wondering how, who's actually using it at the moment, um, this is straight from the Realm website. It's it's been updated since I last saw it. Um, these guys, um, as you can see, there's a lot of really prominent companies using Realm already. Um, things like BBC are now using it in their iPlayer app. So things like Doctor Who is now almost technically powered by Realm. All that stuff. Um, yeah, and, and Bandai made like a Power Rangers app with it recently, and uh, and group group both Groupon's Android and iOS apps are powered by it. So as you can see, there's a lot of a lot of good companies that are actually invested in it already, um, which is a really good sign. Uh, it also means that we're pretty nervous because now it's operating at such a crazy scale. Um, if there are any bugs in there we haven't picked up yet, they'll probably be amplified. Um, we recently announced a few weeks back that there are now half a billion mobile devices out there with an app that has Realm in it on it. Um, that's a lot of devices, which is really good. We're really happy. That's all within a year of, of release. Um, so it's been gung-ho growth, which is really good. Okay, so that's all good. That's, 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 the, that's the spiel. 
what does it actually look like in implementation? Um, I'm only going to be using um, uh, Swift for this talk, sorry. Like I, I still like Objective-C, but I figured for, for in terms of relevance, uh, Swift are probably more appropriate here. To actually install Realm, it's very easy. Go to the website, realm.io, download the zip file. If you want to do it statically, just, just gra grab the realm.framework file, stick it into your app, and then because obviously the core is C++, you need to also attach libs, libc++. That's it, and that's it, it's in your app. Um, if, if static framework is, is un linking static frameworks is uncool for you, there's also um, full support for CocoaPods and Carthage. Um, and I think we actually have at least two chaps who work on CocoaPods on, on the Realm team as well. Um, sorry, so the, the very basics. I'm just going to go through the very, the very low-level APIs and try and ramp up uh, as we go along. So the very, the very close first fundamental is there is an object literally is called Realm. And what a Realm object represents is it actually represents the store on disk. So that is the context you use when you're actually generating objects and wanting the system to disk. You add them to a Realm object and, and that um, will actually go ahead and write it to disk. Um, there's obviously a, a ton of boilerplate code for a Realm object. It's just that, which is awesome. Um, out of the box, that's all you need. Um, that includes file path, um, schema versions, uh, a whole path configurations, which you can change if you want, but the default settings are good for 90% of the users, so just that is all you need. And that, that'll save a file, yep, like I said, because actually it represents the store on disk. And that, that will create a file in your, your, your iOS app's um, D, uh, documents directory called default.realm straight away. Um, so it's all done automatically. If you want to change the file path, obviously you can, you can configure that. Um, but just to that line of code, you, you're ready to go. Um, and just, just as, 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 a, as an extra thing, you can actually open up and view the contents of a Realm file with a, an app we put out in the App Store called Realm Browser. And that's, that's, the, that's my little baby. That's my main project at the moment. Okay, so now we actually have the context of where we save it to disk. Uh, how do we actually create objects to persist? So <clears throat> in, in um, Swift, uh, we provide an object called object, which is, this is going to be tricky, so there's like a realm model object, and all you need to do is just subclass that and, and, and just de declare the properties you want to persist. So you have things like, like in this case, we're, we're going to save a dog entry to a database. We have to do a specify the name, which can be a string, age, which is an integer, birth date, and its date, so we can actually save dates as well. Uh, height, which is a float, um, booleans, and we also, also um, allow the ability to, to actually save child realm objects or even a list of realm objects as a, as a, ch as a child of this object. Um, and as of last week, um, this, this is, this is, we're pretty happy, um, object properties now KVO compliant, which means you can actually just register for when those, those properties change and then get a notification automatically, which means that realm is now compatible with reactive Cocoa, which is really, really cool. All right, so what does the code to actually create a new object and actually save it to disk look like? All right, this might be pretty complicated, so bear with me. <laughs> Done. It's really easy. <laughs> you just create a new object, populate its properties with whatever you want, and then all you have to do is access the Realm file, and then how it works is you open up a write transaction. You, you can't just add an object. You have to actually mark a Realm file as open for writing, and then you just in there you say add object, and you're done. Um, and the cool thing about Realm is, um, well, write transactions are serial. Only one can be open at a time. Read transactions are asynchronous. So if you had another thread working in the background, working in Realm, it would not be blocked by this. It would still be reading data straight from disk. Um, speaking of reading, it's really easy. Like all you have to do is just say realms are objects of the type you want. That, could, that pulls out every object. Um, and when I say every object, it's actually a representation of every object. Uh, data is lazy loaded as you go along. So only when you access the properties are they actually paged from disk. So it's very efficient. You, have, you don't have to worry about pulling it in chunks just in case you're going to run out of memory or anything. You can grab the whole lot and just, and just work with it as you go along. Um, and then once you have a result, you can easily apply filters. You can actually do like really basic ones like strings here, but also supply, it also supports NS predicates. Not all the NS predicate operations, but a good majority of them. And then on top of that, you can also sort them really easily. So if you wanted, if you wanted to query or fetch from, from a database a list of puppies uh, sorted alphabetically, you can even just condense that into one line of code, which is really good. Um, so now we've had adding and reading. How do you actually go about changing the properties of, a, of, a, um, of, a pro of an object? Um, it's not as easy as you'd think. Um, basically, because of that, that write transaction model, you can't just take an object out of a realm file and then try and change its name. That'll trigger an exception straight away, which means it's very easy to pick up. But um, 
you have to be aware that you can't just, up, just update a property. You actually have to open an, uh, another write transaction and then change it. Um, you, get, you get the hang of this very quickly, quickly because um, unlike, other, like, like, unlike core data, to, for example, when you do something wrong, like Realm will throw an exception straight away. So you will know exactly what you've done wrong, exactly where, where in your code that the, the problem is occurring, and there'll also be a really helpful message telling you how to fix it. Um, and yeah, yeah, it must be done inside a write transaction. Um, and the final one, because this one, this one can be kind of tricky, but good. Um, all Realm objects are thread confined. So if you make an object um, on one thread and then try and pass it to another thread through a block or something, that'll, that'll cause an exception straight away. Um, so basically, yeah, like I just said there. Um, so basically what you can do is um, because Realm fetch uh, requests are very quickly, it's actually better to just pass an identifier, which is usually a primary key, to the new thread, and then just refetch the object from the Realm file on that thread. So it's very easy code. Obviously, we, basically what you can do is you can actually even define a primary key in Realm. You don't have to, it's completely optional. Um, but you, you can actually declare it, saying this, 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 this property is a primary key, which then means it gets indexed. And then it's really easy to get the, to, to like re-access the object on a different thread, just, just cop, make a copy of the, of the primary key, move it to the new thread, and then just refetch the object. And that's it. And you can actually just work with the object from there. Um, finally, this one's a bit complicated, so I'm only going to talk about it really quickly. Um, schema migrations, obviously, when, you, when you're working on an app, you're going to have to change, you add new columns or merge columns. Basically, every single Realm file has a, has a schema version. They start at zero, and then every time you want to do a change, you basically just, um, you, well, actually, yeah, they have a schema, they have a schema version. If it detects that the, your, your model object in your code does not match up to the schema inside the Realm file, it will throw an exception. Um, but basically what you can do <coughs> is, um, as of last week, you can now create a configuration object, which is how you actually configure how Realm files behave, which lets you supply a block and the new schema version all in one go, which will then automatically execute once, which will upgrade the schema of your Realm file, give you a chance to, to move data around between columns if you want to, but you don't have to, and then just keep going after that really easily. It's like, it's like a one operation next time the app opens. Um, and there's a, there's a big block of sample code that, explain, that walks through it very quickly at realm.io slash docs slash swift. So obviously it's not, it's not a new product. It, it launched middle of last year. It's, not, it's just over a year old now. Um, there's a lot of new features coming up. Um, one thing it does not support presently is the ability to set a property as nil. Like you saw, you saw when we were defining objects earlier, the object earlier, every, every property needed like some kind, of, some kind of property, like an empty string or a zero. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, so you can't actually set an object as nil. Um, a lot of people need that in their implementations, especially if they're working with JSON. So um, that's coming very, very soon. Like, I don't know for sure, but within the next month. Um, another one's fine grain notifications. Like, we have KVO support, but we don't actually have the ability to tell when an object is added or removed yet. That's another thing we're working on. And we're working in, 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 like in concurrency with, with Swift 1.2. There's also Swift 2.0 branch um, available, which you can work with right now, but that'll be made uh, official once iOS 9 drops. Um, so where can you go to get the Selby framework? The website is realm.io. If you want to get in touch, um, we, we're very active on Twitter. There's like three people manning the Realm Twitter, probably more than that. Um, every, all of our code is hosted on GitHub. And we, we, we actively support a hashtag or a category on, on a Stack Overflow, which is just like hash realm. And if anyone ever posts a, a question about it on Stack Overflow, we get, we get notified automatically. All right. Thanks for watching, everyone.